844, a number that symbolizes gridiron greatness at Syracuse University. It started with Jim Brown, considered by many as the greatest running back of all time. And then there was Heisman Trophy winner Ernie Davis, who led the Orange to the national championship in 1959. Following in Davis's footsteps was Floyd Little, the 1966 ECAC Player of the Year. A three-time collegiate All-American, Little enjoyed a stellar career with the Denver Broncos, a career culminated by Little's enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Those accomplishments alone make Floyd Little a Syracuse legend. Welcome to Syracuse Legends, I'm Mark Larson. Floyd Little came to Syracuse in 1963 on a promise he made to the late great Ernie Davis. Just like Davis and Jim Brown before him, Floyd wore the fabled number 44 on his way to becoming one of the best running backs in the country. A three-time All-American, Little finished his career number six on the all-time rushing list with 2,704 yards. Drafted sixth overall by the Denver Broncos in 1967, Little also became the first Broncos player to be enshrined in the team's ring of honor. In 2011, Little returned to his alma mater, becoming a special assistant to athletic director Daryl Gross. Little calls his decision to come to Syracuse the best decision of his life. Floyd Little, a true Syracuse legend. I grew up in Connecticut uh, with, uh, with not a lot of opportunity. I was never the sharpest knife in the draw or the smartest person in the room, but I found a way to get through uh, all of the things I needed to to get here at Syracuse. If you knew where I came from, how does one get to, to Canton, Ohio from, from the projects in, in Connecticut? Well, it's, it's been a journey that's been very interesting and intriguing. And it, it took a lot of uh, commitment and sacrifice and, and determination and desire and all those things I talk about. How I got to Syracuse is a very unique and interesting thing because I had to go to a military school or a prep school, if you will, after my high school days because I wasn't capable or smart enough based on my IQ score to be a college student. And so I had to go to a military school not one year, but two. And I was able to uh, acquire all of the things that I needed to, to, to learn, that I should have had the opportunity to learn in high school for four years. I crammed it in in two years in military school. And as a result of that, I had 47 scholarships. I mean, I could have gone any place, but I had scholarships for, for 47 other colleges. And one, a couple to the military academies. Uh, West Point being one of them, being recruited directly by General MacArthur in his hotel room at the Waldorf Astoria. I'll never forget that. That was a very, very interesting opportunity to meet one of our heroes. And to meet him and to meet some of the people that he had around him was an unbelievable experience. And then after meeting him and going to Army and, and competing in the, the physical endurance test that all of the military players or students have to go through, and the medical examination. I mean, it's a real stringent thing you have to do to be at West Point. So anytime I see one in one of those uniforms, I got all the respect in the world for them. And I have all the respect in the world for all of our military people, not just from Army, Navy, and the Air Force Academy, but all of them. But I broke all the records that had been set over the years as a person athletically coming to that school. A week after I left West Point, uh, Ernie Davis stopped by in the neighborhood, snoring like crazy. Ben Swartzwaller, Bill Bell, the offensive backfield coach, uh, offensive running back coach, and one of our local alums that were was a very, very good uh, supporter of Syracuse University, uh, Andy Marciano, came to my house, pitch black at night, dark in the snow, and uh, Ernie was with him, just won the Heisman, went to go to dinner. So we left the house after meeting my family. We went to a place called Jocko Sullivan's. It's on Yale's campus. It's kind of like a bar and grill. And Ernie and I sat down and 
looked at the menu and we both had never had steak and lobster, so we thought it'd be a good idea to order steak and lobster, so we did, and he said, hey, let's go have a little talk. So Ernie and I got up and left and went in the men's bathroom and someone, someone had to be standing guard because for a half hour we were in there or more, nobody came in the bathrooms. And her, Ernie and I just talked about a lot of things, talked about Syracuse, talked about Swalt Swaller, talked about the academics, talked about the, the help you got and he got and I would get. Talk about running the ball a lot, the coach didn't like throwing it. And he talked about the Heisman, talked about his deal with Pepsi that he made. I mean, we talked about what guys talk about in their teens and late teens and early 20s. And then I looked at my watch and realized I had been, I ordered this food quite a while ago. So I got to say, well, Ernie, uh, after 35 minutes, I said, let's go eat. I'll go to Syracuse. Uh, I said that to go eat my steak and lobster. Never realizing, you know, he passed away three months later. And one of the things that I really, really am a stickler on is when I give my word, that's my bond. I don't own anything more valuable than my word. I gave Ernie my word that I'd go to Syracuse. And when they announced that he had, he had passed away, I called uh, Coach Walswalder and told him I was coming. And it was the greatest decision, at least one of the greatest decisions that I've ever made. I benefited from Ernie, Ernie's relationship with Ben Swalswaller because, you know, under, under uh, Jim Brown, I, I, I would imagine Jim wasn't allowed to do a lot of things and he was really strict on Jim. Jim was a handful, if you will, and it was kind of sometimes not manageable. And he took a little bit out of it, on, took a little bit out of it on Ernie, but Ernie kind of softened him. In some, in some respects. And I think when Ernie passed away, it really affected the coach. So as a result of his relationship with Ernie, which may have been not as great as it was with me, but I benefited from that. Because I've been over Ben's house many times, had dinner at his house, slept over, got to know his family really well. And my relationship with Ben was solid. The atmosphere on campus when I was here was was equal to what it is now. I mean, we're, we're, we're family here. Unlike a lot of universities across the country, we, we have something unique and different at Syracuse University. Coming up on Syracuse Legends, we'll focus in on Floyd's NFL career. Why going to the Denver Broncos wasn't exactly what Floyd expected when draft day rolled around. That's next, when Syracuse Legends continues. Welcome back to Syracuse Legends, I'm Mark Larson. After closing out his college career, Floyd Little was drafted in the first round by the Denver Broncos in the 1967 draft. Prior to it, he had no idea his new football home would bring him all the way out to the Mile High City. But going to Denver ended up working out just fine for this Syracuse legend. But going to the Broncos had to be one of the greatest things that ever happened to me as a result of how it ended up. I was supposed to go to the Jets. Sonny Warblin was the owner, Wave Eubank was the coach. They had seen a lot of the Syracuse games because we were on the same coast. The guy that I mentioned, Andy Marciano, was a very good friend of Sonny Warblin, the owner of the Jets. He was influential in getting the owner of the Jets to come to the Syracuse game because they were friends. And he's a Syracuse alum. So after coming and seeing some of the games I played in, where I've scored five touchdowns here for Sonny Werblin and Weeb Eubank said, we gotta have this kid. But the unfortunate thing was that it was the year of the merger. My class was the first class when the NFL and AFL merged. And you can only go to one team. There was no more bidding war for players. That ended. So you either sign with the team that drafted you or you go to Canada. No exception. And they did it because the dollar amounts were getting to be astronomical. The Jim Grabowskis, the Joe Namens, the, 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 the Don Anderson, they were getting five to $600,000. And the old NFL said, we got to stop this. 
So they merged so that they can control the salaries and the bonuses. But Sonny Warburton and Weeb Eubank told Andy Marshall and Anno and me that Floyd can last until the ninth pick in the draft. In the first round, I had, I was the sixth player pick, but they had the ninth pick. So I, everybody would call me to tell me if they drafted me, would I sign with them? They didn't want to waste their draft pick and not having the guy sign. Because this was the first year they were trying to figure it out. So I, uh, I had talked to uh, Vince Lombardi, who is now a great coach with the Green Bay Packers, wanted to know what my availability be, would be like. I told him there isn't any. I'm committed to go to the Jets. Jim thinks he just left Chicago to go to Minnesota, wanting to know what my draft status would be. And that year he drafted uh, Alan Page, Gene Washington, and Clinton Jones from Michigan and Alan Page from Notre Dame. And I told him I, I wasn't available. And everyone else in that first eight possible picks, I told them that I had already signed a deal with the Jets, which I hadn't because I couldn't, because I was in track and I would violate my amateur standing and I didn't want to do that. But now Val Pinchback was our sports information director same job that Sue Edson had. And she, and, and, and Val had gone to New York to work with the league. And what happened was when the leagues merged, Val went to Denver. And he was working for Al Davis, who went to Oakland as the managing general partner. Al went to Denver. So during the draft day, Lou Saban, who was at Maryland, Former Buffalo Bill, great coach and player for the Cleveland Browns. He remember Syracuse and Maryland playing and I'm having a field day against Maryland. So now he's no longer the coach at Maryland. He's not a brand new coach with the Denver Broncos. So he has visions of me running the scissor play at the Maryland game. So he goes into Val Pinchback and he says, Val, tell me a little bit about Floyd Lee. He says, well, Floyd's a great player. Why do you need to know about him? We already decided to draft unanimously Gene Upshaw, who, as you all know, went on to be a Hall of Famer and a great player. And all the coaches wanted Gene to start with their offensive line and work from there. He said, uh, what is this deal with the Jets that he's claiming that he has already signed? And Val said, no, Floyd is an honorable man. He would never violate his amateur standings. He has not signed anything, anybody, knowing Floyd. But why you ask? We're already unanimously, unanimously going to take Gene Upshaw. Who said, we said, can we build our team around this guy? He says, of course we can, but this is the moot point. He said, I'm going to draft Floyd a little. And when I got the call that Denver had drafted me, and I'm sitting waiting for that $400,000 contract that I was promised the same deal that Namath had, wind up with the 10,000 as a result of the merger. And I was just angry as, as, as I could be with the valve. I didn't know anything about Denver. Why would anybody draft me in Denver? I'm, I'm on the East Coast. I don't know anything. Denver, where is that at? Is that in the United States? That was my attitude. But when I went to visit Denver, it was, the most picturesque place I've ever seen. It was beautiful, it was in April, those snow-capped mountains, it was like in the 70s. I was like, wow. It was a small town, but growing. And when I was drafted by Denver and whatever, I was angry because I didn't get a chance to, to go to the Jets to, for the dollars. And, 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 and the Heisman Trophy winner that year was Steve Spurrier, who was drafted by the 49ers. And I says, I want a dollar more than he gets. So when Steve Spurrier signed with the, with the San Francisco 49ers and someone told me what he signed for and I got a dollar more than he got, he didn't get anything. Because if I just got a dollar more, he didn't make any, any money either. 
But but that was how I got to Denver, and I was and, I, and you know, it was great. It was uh, in New York, as Emerson Boozer would tell me, "Hey man, I'm glad you didn't uh, didn't last." He said, I, "I got a chance to go to go to the Jets, and I got a chance to wear a Super Bowl ring." So now when I see Emerson Booz, I says, I got a chance to go to Denver and I'm wearing a Hall of Fame ring. There's a lot of Super Bowl rings, but there are only 280 of these babies, pal. And when you get one of these, that speaks volumes to the kind of career you had, not just the game. So you won a Super Bowl ring, I never did, but I got a ring that I would imagine you and most people that played in the National Football League would love to have and would trade your Super Bowl ring for a Hall of Fame ring. I guarantee it. Floyd Little finished his NFL career with more than 12,000 all-purpose yards and 54 touchdowns, and those numbers landed number 44 a spot in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When Syracuse Legends returns, Floyd talks about coming back to the place where it all began and why he loves what he does. Welcome back to Syracuse Legends, I'm Mark Larson. Who says he can't go home again? In the case of Floyd Little, home is Syracuse University. Today, Floyd is back at his alma mater, serving as an ambassador for the athletics department. It's a way for Floyd to get back to a university he loves dearly. I came back quite a bit, quite a bit. I mean, I knew, I knew uh, Daryl. I, I knew the guy that Daryl worked for. In fact, Mike Garrett called me about Daryl having an opportunity to interview for the athletic director job. And I knew Daryl through that, through my mutual friend who beat me out of the Heisman Trophy, Mike Garrett, for USC. So I've known Daryl. Daryl's an athlete. Daryl would have me come back many, many times for different functions, different occasions. So having watched what was happening here, watched what Daryl was retiring in number, being on the committee to hire a new coach, I mean, constantly. So my wife was like, well, they bring you back enough. Why don't they put you on some kind of a retainer where you would do all their promotional stuff and every now and then come back and do stuff for them. That would be great. And of course, I guess they all heard it because when Scott Sitwell left, he says, hey, why don't you come back? Be my special assistant. The wife was going, well, well, what do you think? She said, I don't want to go back to Syracuse because she's from Syracuse. She was on the city council here. And she said, back to Syracuse? Are you kidding? I said, I think we ought to. I decided to come back. And uh, Dale and I are very, very close. And we cut out of the same cloth. We believe the same things. We, we do the same things. We say the same things. And having an opportunity to work with yourself that's how I look at it. We just had a peanut butter jelly sandwich over at the, at the cafeteria, walking back, laughing, and enjoying where we are, what the football team has done, what the coaches have done, what Schaefer has done in his first year. Just sharing certain information. So me being back, being able to assist Daryl everywhere I can, and to mentor a lot of our young athletes, student athletes, uh, it, 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 it's been good. It's been good for me. I'm, I'm just having the time of my life. I'm enjoying it every day. It, when, I, when I miss a day, I'm not feeling really good. I haven't been sick since I've been back. I've been here every day that I'm here and enjoy coming here. So I think it's going to keep me young. It's going to keep me uh, active. And it's going to uh, keep me around a little longer. I left Syracuse in 67 came back in 2011, 44 years later. Second time I made a decision to come to Syracuse. Two of the greatest opportunities of a lifetime. The best job or thing that I've done, I've been a professional athlete, I've been a car dealer for 32 years. This is my favorite time of my life, being back amongst the student athletes and the faculty, 
and everybody that's connected with Syracuse University, I'm having the best time of my life. You look forward to helping shape a life, helping to add to someone's opportunity. You know, like for me, it's, it's an attitude. I mean, there's three things you control, right? Attitude, participation, enthusiasm. You have 100% control over those, don't you? So every morning I, I, I wake up and I say, you know, quietly or sometimes loud, today is the best day of my life and tomorrow's gotta be better. I wanna make something happen. There's three kinds of people in the world. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, them that don't know what happened. Who do you wanna be, Floyd? I wanna make something happen today. I wanna change life today. I wanna add some value to somebody. I wanna make them feel that they have value and that they are here for a purpose. I talk about GPS with, my, with the student athletes. I ask them, do you know what GPS means? They said, yes, global positioning system. I said, no, it's grace. All of us is given a grace when we're born. It's unlike anybody else's. It's yours and yours alone. You can't sell it, you can't trade it. That is what your blessing is. The P is for passion. All of us have a passion that we wanna to try to find out what it is. And all our lives, we work on developing skill to impart that passion to fulfill the grace that we have. Most of us leave this world not knowing what our purpose is on this earth. You can only find out what your purpose is through your passion. And once you find out what your passion is, now you can find out what your purpose is. Because when you're able to fulfill your passion in life, and you're able to impart that through your skill through other people in your life, and you see what they do with their lives after you've helped influence them or help find what their passion is, then, then when you find out what your grace is, your life changes you. You're not the same person. When you know every day what your purpose is, like a lot of times I know why I was, I'm here. The lives that I've affected since I've been here, it was already written. I'm supposed to be here to change your life, to make it right for you, to help you fulfill your dream, to help you fulfill your purpose, to help you find your grace. That's why I'm here. And sometimes it's so amazing when I look at and watch what I see, some of the people that I've touched, what they've done, how they've, even our quarterback, Terrell Hunt, how I was able to intertwine my life with his. And now I see him and watch him grow and mature. And what he did in his last game matured like unbelievable. And I can sit back and say to myself, Floyd, maybe that's why you were here. To witness that and to help that. And it's, it, it, when you know why you're here, your life is different. And what motivates me to come here every day? So I can pass on the joy and the blessings that I've been blessed with. The gift to others, to share with others, to watch others, to influence others, to, to, to encourage others to do great things and be great and give back. Floyd's accomplishments both on and off the field are just way too numerous to mention. But his love for the orange is clearly evident from the moment you meet him. Number 44, Floyd Little, a true Syracuse legend.